long ago. The far corners of big box shops and electronic stores were treasure troves of abandoned software. Both of us share warm childhood memories of hours spent digging through dusty back shelves and crowded bins of battered boxes. Every so often we'd pull some obscure RPG or forgotten FPS or other ancient relic of the floppy era and gaze at it in wonderment like a couple of nerdy Indiana Joneses. Even today, collectors still sift through eBay in search of the big boxes, cryptic manuals, and copy protection cards of this era. It's a testament to the strong memories that sit beneath the silicone surfaces of these meager bits and bytes. Today's episode zooms in on a particular pair of nostalgia nuggets. The Silent Storm. And its fully featured expansion, Silent Storm Sentinels. Does this strangely inventive strategy RPG still stand up, or have fuzzy gamer memories clouded our minds with the fog of war? That's what we aim to find out on today's episode of... Welcome to Backlog Quest, where we storm the trenches of games gone by in order to bring back hidden gems. My name is Boss Sauce. And I'm Rolling Coons. And together, we, we are, are the, the Two-Headed two -headed Hero. At its core, Silent Storm is a squad-based strategy RPG. While similar in scope to the XCOM series of games, Silent Storm is much closer in spirit to one of our personal all-time favorites, Jagged Alliance 2. And you'll see more than a few through lines between these two games as we unpack the details here today. HISTORY LESSON! Silent Storm was published in 2003 by Joe Wood Productions and developed by Nival Interactive, a St. Petersburg-based development house with a long history of successful and unique strategy games, as well as the occasional offbeat action RPG titles and other weird shit like Hard Truck Apocalypse. Following the commercial success of series such as Rage of Mages and Ether Lords, pour one out for Ether Lords, I will say. Naval developed an in-house 3D game engine that was fairly impressive for the time, featuring highly destructible environments and detailed physics. Silent Storm was the flagship title for this new tech, which was imaginatively titled The Silent Storm Engine. How original. This engine was subsequently used in at least half a dozen more titles. One of these included Heroes of Might and Magic 5, which was widely considered to be a worthy 3D reboot of the popular fantasy strategy series. Around this time, Naval was also in the middle of a big expansion push, opening up several satellite offices and publishing several other developers, including Crank's Productions, makers of the impeccable Hammer Fight. Psst, hey, hey buddy. You wanna buy some Hammer Fight? Yeah, you can check out our Hammer Fight retrospective right here in my armpit where I keep things that I sell to strangers on the street. <laughs> then a massive data breach hit Naval in 2016, which was attributed at least in part to the actions of Ukrainian hackers during the 2014 Russo-Ukrainian War. Since 2017, Naval has remained strangely silent and stormless. As mentioned, Silent Storm's premise takes place during an alternate history World War II. Tonally, it's far less band of brothers and far more, I don't know, Robotech? Silent Storm has a fairly simplistic story, told largely through a combination of puppet shows and a disjointed mess of journals and clues that have to be discovered while you dodge bullets. Even so, it's the Saturday morning cartoon version of World War II, saturated with spy fiction, wanton destruction, big clanky robot suits, and cheesy one-liners. May flowers ignore ye grave. And that's all part of the fun. The plot starts out straightforwardly enough with the player stepping into the role of a special operations commando, leader of a squad that runs dangerous covert missions behind enemy lines with the task of rooting out traitors. While the Allied and Axis forces are embroiled in the big one, a shadowy organization vies for power behind the scenes, choosing this particular moment for a power grab while the world's armies weaken each other in the clash. Thor's Hammer, a conspiratorial faction that would feel right at home in your average James Bond movie has been using its high-level connections in world politics and militaries on both sides of the war to gradually build up forces and armaments, as well as developing advanced technology such as green lasers and gas-powered robot suits. Over the course of the game, your intrepid squad uncovers their endgame, the launch of an orbital satellite that houses a really big green laser. Since the prospect of Thor's hammer having its very own Death Star is decidedly not great, it's up to your little squad of six to build or steal some clanky robot suits of their own and put an end to this nefarious plan. 
Once you choose to fight as the nasty Nazis or the allied forces, the game begins proper. After a brief character creation that provides a fairly admirable amount of customization, Agent Grandma reporting for duty, you're launched straight into a tutorial mission. More importantly, you'll also be introduced to the most useful pair of tactical tools Silent Storm has on offer. The first of these is the ability to suss out enemy locations by noise alone, making blind fire and grenading around corners a viable option. This comes in extremely handy for the second feature, the ability to shoot through or demolish nearly any structure in the game. Bringing the boom sends bricks and dust flying everywhere and showers the area in debris. Machine guns become handy lockpicks when a door stands in your way, but why bother using a door at all when you have an overflowing pocket full of grenades? Sniper tower got you covered, knock it over. Soldiers got you cornered, drop the roof on their heads. Demolishing the floor beneath an enemy gives you a precious wily coyote pause before they tumble to their demise. Large-scale building destruction can easily kill the frame rate and crash the game. But, minor gripes aside, this feature alone adds a ton to the game's World War II Saturday morning cartoon feel. To help you along this perilous path, there's plenty of weaponry, more than enough to satisfy any firearms enthusiasts. You'll find iconic MP40s, Mosin rifles, and Thompsons, although a trench gun is sorely missing from the lineup. All of this is managed in a good old-fashioned grid inventory! Any shiny new toys you find in the field can be dragged back to your base to supplement the armory. This means that the game not only has the physics wackiness that I crave in my daily breakfast cereal, it also satisfies my second dark urge. Dragging and dropping things into my inventory and then slowly carting them back to my home base until everything in the game world is in my home base. So yeah, the physics are charmingly janky and stand shoulder to shoulder with Silent Storm's environment busting. Terrain advantages apply to line of sight as well as shooting and throwing weapons, which you'll find out the first time your own grenade lands at your feet. While soldiers can soak up a ton of individual bullets without moving an inch, a lethal hit will launch them into orbit John Woo style. It's a slap in the face to Newton, but goddamn it's fun. Most of the game is wrapped around a detailed layer of strategic shooting combat, which is ruled by a rudimentary action point system. Soldiers have extremely deep controls here. They can strafe around corners and change between a bunch of different stances and movement speeds with the tap of a key, or they can reserve points for reaction shots. Other features like the called shot system and overwatch come in extremely handy for your snipers, and your commandos can choose to invest varying amounts of action points into aiming for greater chances at success. Balance isn't really Silent Storm's strongest suit. Pathfinding can be problematic when there's a lot going on, especially when half of a building has collapsed and the stairs were in the other half. Basic stealth mechanics exist? but staying hidden is mostly based on enemy line of sight. Backstabs are possible, but melee is inefficient. You really have to develop a melee-specific ninja character to make it fun, and by that point, you're gonna come across big robots, and the big robots don't care if you stab them with a knife. Scouts are much more suited to the role of spotters for your snipers and machine gunners, doubly so due to the emphasis on sniping and mag dumping. Catching some lead usually results in a status debuff, which can range from unsteadying your aim to temporary blindness, and these statuses can affect both your own troops and the enemy AI. While the AI can do some bonehead rush moves out in the open, they don't always blindly run towards gunfire. Cover is important, but it's also impermanent, and players can take advantage of the AI's reluctance to blow down walls or shoot through doors. The game also lacks a morale system, although heavily wounded opponents will attempt to get away. I've also caught enemy soldiers flanking or hiding in ambush. Positioning, patience, and good sightlines will be among the most useful tools when the bullets start flying. And as you get better at these tactics, your soldiers will too. Impermanent cover in a strategy RPG had already been done, of course. But this one did it in 3D. That's the cool thing. Your guy can be sneaking around on the ground floor of a building and then hear boot steps above them and just like take the whole floor out with a big machine gun. It really encourages experimentation, for sure. I hear a guy over there, so I'm gonna whip this grenade over a wall and take out the whole wall, or like throw it into a window and blow up the entire floor. It's fun to blow up part of a building and then like see it like a dollhouse with its face pulled off. I don't think there's even a game now that has done that as well as this one. Naval's roots run deep in the RPG realm, and Silent Storm is no exception. 
pop open that character tab and you'll see a hefty pile of stats and attributes. And yet another nod to Jagged Alliance 2, these can all be trained up via Skyrim rules. Learn by doing. Not all skills are created equal, unfortunately. For example, you'll be using the shooting skill on nearly every turn. Grinding out the other skills, like medical, proves difficult. Unless, of course, one of your commandos is willing to donate their body to science. And are you really going to spend a long time arming and disarming bombs to pump engineering? Like me? If so, we commend your dedication. Gaining experience points and upping your skills increases the character's level, which in turn grants access to new sections of the skill tree. These trees are dependent on your locked-in character class, and it really feels like thought was put into some of them more than others. While the scout, the soldier, and especially the sniper are the most useful, the medic, grenadier, and engineer kinda get left out in no man's land. These three classes feature underpowered skills and lower action points. The grenadier is slow, and his increased throwing range is quickly outdated once the first missile launcher drops. Medic and engineer skills are difficult to level up, and it's likely you'll hit the end game without making much use of either due to their redundant skill sets. Nearly any character can bandage well enough to keep your operatives from bleeding out, and nearly any lock or landmine can simply be cleared with the liberal application of munitions. Of course, this isn't very sneaky, but all this really makes me wish the skill trees were reworked a little bit or even merged into one big skill tree rather than them being separated out by an arbitrary locked in class system. Even more frustrating is that there's a huge wealth of specialized equipment for bedpan commandos and juice jerkers alike. This specialized gear is also gated behind ridiculously high skill level requirements, thereby relegating it to the back of the depot where it will surely decay from disuse. There's supposed to be a perk that removes the skill requirements for gear, but this feature seems broken as well, so screw it. The smart strategy is to simply double up on the good classes rather than diversifying with medics or engineers. This is a bit of a shame too, since the engineer has an entire section of the skill tree devoted to using the awesome giant robot suits but the anemic bonuses for bringing along an engineer are kind of outweighed by letting a soldier or sniper bring their extra AP and weapon skills to the pilot's chair. And while you won't be seeing them until the latter half of Silent Storm, these big stompy robot suits, the Panzerkleins, are the stars of the show. Panzerklein is supposedly some kind of smashed German word that roughly translates to walking tank. And these things look freaking awesome. But just look at them. Chunky humanoid metal constructs with bomber cockpits and giant guns strapped to the arms. Gasoline engines jiggling around on their backs as they belch smoke into the air and slowly stamp around on the battlefield. These come in a variety of shapes and flavors, which are somewhat faction dependent based on whose machine you're snagging when you perform Grand Theft Panzer. Yes, your squaddies can enter or exit a PK at any time, or fix them up and walk them on home. Allied and Axis Panzerkleins have slightly different construction and incompatible arsenals, and the Thor's Hammer PKs can sometimes be equipped with cool green anti-tank lasers, as well as stealth camo. Hell yeah. Hell yeah! It's cheesy science fiction, but it's the best kind of cheesy science fiction. Panzerkleins have one major drawback, they have the land speed of a catatonic sloth, so the best tactics are mixed unit tactics. Between the physics, the blind firing, and demolition, an obvious efficient strategy quickly emerges. Sneak in a scout to sniff out your enemies, use snipers or panzerkleins to blind fire through the buildings, and reduce them all to hamburger. With all this cool hardware, it's sort of strange that there isn't even a single mission featuring a working tank. Imagine having to send these goofy little metal men against a T-34 in a huge boss battle skirmish. Really seems like a missed opportunity, but the focus on man-to-man -man combat still serves to keep encounters small and manageable and interesting. All these fun tools and toys wouldn't be much good if there wasn't a decent campaign to test them out on. Fortunately, Silent Storm has not one, but two. At the beginning, you can choose to fight through the Secret War as either Axis or Allied Forces, although the last quarter of each campaign plays out roughly the same. Both campaigns start out with an introductory mission. After these first trials, your custom commando is swept into a base of sorts, and this is where you can tell that the campaigns were definitely not created equal. The Allies HQ has a general, a medic, a quartermaster, you know, characters. Like this dude that's really horny for robots. Day and night? In my dreams, all I can think about are those panzerkleins. Those panzerkleins. 
The Axis side has all its own unique gear, fully voiced soldiers, big stompy robots, and distinct visual style. So why is their campaign so half-baked? It's slapdash to the point where the Axis base doesn't have any staff. The Axis base is empty and awkward, with your resources literally phoned in by an announcer that signs off with PIF AWKWARD. The Axis campaign also has half the runtime. When it comes down to it, this still means more Silent Storm to play, which is always welcome, but for me the best part about the Axis campaign was friendly firing on your own little team of fascists. Even when you lose as the Axis, well, that's a few more dead Nazis. Net gain, really. Some of the more involved central storyline missions are multi-part operations taking place over several maps. Most of the time, however, objectives stick to the formula of kill all the other guys or find some files. The offense and defense objectives are usually the most fun. Random instances of these can be found popping up all around the overworld maps, which is great news for the grinding inclined. <laughs> At times, the game will send in waves of reinforcements, resulting in drawn-out fights or sticky three-way battles. At other times, Silent Storm starts your squad off in precarious scenarios or quests you with capturing an enemy soldier alive, which in context means don't completely explode them. Intel hunts can be a little more problematic, requiring you to scour entire maps to find a few pieces of paper. Items can bug out and spawn inside of furniture, requiring you to systematically destroy every table and chair until they pop up. This is great, no notes here. On the plus side, finding some of the optional intel can unlock secret scenarios, which can contain some more special secret weaponry or panzerkleins to pilfer. A sudden difficulty spike near the end of each campaign makes the endgame feel much less like an open-ended strategy game and more like a puzzle where things explode. Some of these are multi-part missions that can take literally hours to complete, so making a mistake early on can set your progress back quite a bit, unless you're applying judicious use of the same skull. Hi everyone, it's me, it's me, Roland Kunz. I'm here to tell you, just save scum for this one. Just for this one? I know that you don't like to do it. I know that you do. I'm looking at you. I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. <laughs> the game is also moddable and includes several mutators that can change up the combat to be more lethal or otherwise add replay value. A map maker and game editor is actually included with some versions of the game. The editor can be difficult to get running due to the need for some proprietary ancient Microsoft libraries, and I can't imagine anyone but the most devoted Silent Storm fans making an attempt at this. The challenge remains open for those that want to try their hand at making their own adventures. Silent Storm was a fairly decent looking and sounding game for its time, and although the beauty has faded, there's plenty to appreciate here. The game shows itself off in an honest to god arcade style attract mode. Weird feature for sure, but idling the main menu for two and a half minutes or so will start up a little randomized rumble between some AI soldiers. Looking at Silent Storm today, you'll see some of its faults. Muddy textures, puppety character heads, all of which are affected by the super goofy physics. The game is stuck in a 4x3 ratio, and the few widescreen fixes that exist either stretch out the graphics or break other parts of the interface entirely. Therefore, unfortunately, the best way to play is to stick with the black bars. However, if you look a little closer, you'll see there's a lot of attention to detail on the models themselves. Equipment appears on the actual character models, down to individual grenades. And there's a big variety of different clothing and outfits amongst the various character classes. Animations aren't too bad, and there's a lot of animations for all the different character actions. Some are really hilarious and over the top, like this dude one-handing a machine gun. Environments have decent lighting and shadows, and some of the effects still hold up pretty well. Muzzle flashes strike in the dark, ricochets and stray rounds explode into debris, and of course the ever-present devastating explosions still look pretty cool. The amount of feedback each individual bullet provides is rather impressive. Dust showers out from shot bricks, wood splinters from damaged doors, and so on. It's a really minor but very immersive detail, seen more in shooters like Duke Nukem 3D as well as its modern imitators, and it's really effective here. Levels themselves are fairly small, but most have a decent amount of verticality and destructibility. The action all takes place in fully 3D combat zones, small dioramas set in an ominous black void. Marching your little models around as they systematically reduce Europe to rubble gives Silent Storm a great 
tabletop miniatures vibe. Story beats are all relayed with some period-appropriate early 2000s in-engine cutscenes, and these feats of digital puppeteering feature clumsy yet charming dialogue lines that spew out of disconcerting flap-jawed dummy heads at the bottom of the screen. We're not talking Oscar material here, but there's something about this awkward delivery and bizarrely written dialogue that just strikes me as charming. Run! Get out of here! It is a trap! So just brace yourself for questionable accents and enjoy memorable hits like this. The Swiss make the best cheese and the chocolate. That is because a cows grows in high altitudes. In the field, soldiers on both sides will bark out little contextual lines when they're wounded or spotted or pull off a difficult shot, and so on. I doubt they will be missed. While some lines might be, um, questionable at best... <coughs> for motherland! For Stalin! Overall, I really like this. It injects some personality into your squad mates and lightens the tone as they trudge through the smoldering hell of war-torn Europe. Keeping in line with the obvious Jagged Alliance 2 influences, the silliest lines are reserved for the NPCs. Our goose is cooked. The rest of the audio still stands up great. Guns and explosions are nice and beefy, and different guns have different effects based on caliber. This really makes it easy to identify what is being fired at you even if you can't yet see the where. Silence shots are a little Hollywood pew pew for my tastes, but again this speaks to the cartoony tone of the game as a whole. Yells, footsteps, and even wind and rain all add a good amount of ambience to each of the game's many away missions. And as for the soundtrack, well, it's fairly basic background fare, suitable for military mans doing military stuff. The OST plays it safe, snare drum rolls and synth horn hits fill out the audio landscape over the 20-odd music tracks, but it never feels annoying or intrusive. The title theme, though, is a good enough earworm, and many of the combat tracks quicken the pulse with piano runs and plucked strings. None of it's going into my Spotify rotation anytime soon, but it's competent enough. The reception for Silent Storm was critically warm, yet commercially cool, like Chester Cheeto. Watch your step, I'm the OG in the snack game. Despite this, Naval wasted no time in pushing ahead with Sentinels, a fully featured standalone expansion for Silent Storm that added new missions, mechanics, and features while making some questionable design choices. Sentinels contains enough new content to consider it a separate game, but in the interest of brevity, we'll concentrate on what's different between the two games rather than rehash the similarities. Sentinels is set in an alternative post-World War II that saw the defeat of Thor's hammer. The powers that be are far too busy carving up territory and doing the Charleston to realize that the malevolent organization was not entirely eradicated. Therefore, the immense responsibility falls to a specialized multinational group of war vets, mercenaries, expats, and rebels called the Sentinels. The Sentinels have escaped! Right away, the biggest and best improvement to Sentinels is the full widescreen support. This does stretch the graphics slightly, but hey, no more black bars on the sides of your screen. No broken UI elements. The puzzling Attract mode returns again, showing off small CPU-on-CPU -CPU battles when the game is left idle, but as you watch these clumsy computerized commandos fling bullets towards each other, you'll notice that the models have been slightly improved. When bullets hit meat, the wounds even show up appropriately, and heads that catch too much lead kinda resemble the result of crushing a melon with a cinder block. More work for their medic. Ew. This is a prelude to a slightly more serious and cinematic approach than the first game. Sound effects and voiceover quality remain the same, for better or worse, so get ready for a lot more flappy-jawed Muppet dialogue and stiff cutscenes. Which honestly are still kinda cute. They, they try, you know? Over on the music side, there's actually a vast improvement. Complementing the game's overture are several jazzy 40s piano renditions and variations on the theme, which are all quite nice. The number of campaigns has now been cut down by half. Starting out the game's single campaign, you select a pre-made war dog, or create your own. Sentinels boasts improved character generation, and adds some customizations later on like shiny new outfits and body armor. After abduction by unknown forces and a subsequent daring escape, your peppy little merc is invited to do an audition mission for the mysterious Sentinels. The rest of the game has you battling your way through a bunch of dudes wearing black armor and COVID masks in order to unmask their new diabolical plot. This time it's a uh, conspiracy which involves unleashing untold devastation with a powerful nuclear weapon. Your intrepid sentinels must seek out and destroy the remnants of Thor's hammer before alternative history can repeat itself. 
Gameplay contains the most changes. The biggest one is the inclusion of much more big robot action, as well as a better sense of balance when your foot soldiers are trying to fight enemy Panzerkleins. PKs are toned down this time around, no longer the invincible metal behemoths that won the secret war in the first game. More weapons can now make a dent in their previously bulletproof armor. Mission designs now favor larger scale encounters and big battlefields with dozens of bad guys to blow away. While this change can be impressive, there's less of an emphasis on blowing up multi-level structures. You know, the fun part. Big battles often bog encounters down to a crawl. Offsetting these are more bullshitty puzzle missions and timed objectives which, to put it bluntly, feel poorly designed. Some other subtle tactical changes show up in the field, like the ability to perform knockouts and sneak attacks. Picking stuff up off the pavement and shuffling your backpack items around now has an AP cost, which makes your loadout important in the middle of a hairy mission. Weapons can now break down and jam, and while gear degradation can be a pain in most games, it fits the quasi-realism factor here. Scrounging up good guns can make a big difference during the next mission. This does also mean you'll be hoovering up loot like a reverse Santa Claus, but the game thankfully provides a post-mission screen to distribute said loot for maximum lootage and subsequent resale or put in-house. You'll need it because capitalism has taken root in the post-war economy. Boo. Everything from bandages to bullets to uh, collateral damage comes with a price tag. Downside? A lot more grinding random encounters to pick up everything that isn't nailed down and generate that sweet, sweet cash flow. And although Sentinels has some of the most customizable difficulty options ever to be seen, it comes at a price. Dropping the difficulty down means lower mission payouts and crap quality loot, which equates to even more excessive grinding to fund your little operation. Or you can just flip the in-game console on with a quick config file fix and cheat your way past the frustrating parts. Sentinels is a worthy addition to the Silent Storm package. It's definitely worth a play if you just want more of the stompy robot action and comically overpowered bullet physics, provided that you yourself don't mind the grind. So this is normally the point where we'd wrap things up, but wait, there was a third game in the Silent Storm series that is even more obscure and unspoken of than its predecessors. Strangely little can be found on this game, other than a few very questionable download links on ancient looking websites, but apparently it was an overly rushed sequel that takes place in the Cold War era. Not apparently, I played this game. Seriously, huh? I loved the first two games, and I played the crap out of them, and I didn't play Hammer and Sickle much. So, that can tell you something. Well, according to the dredged up reviews that I found, Hammer and Sickle didn't have enough time in the oven to pass muster, and apparently suffered from even more bugs and balance issues than the other two games. So if you happen to know of a reliable place to get a copy that won't shoot viruses through every system file we have, we'd love to hear from you down in the old comments section. At the end of the day, Silent Storm and its expansion pack Sentinels do more than just latch onto the legs of more successful entries into the strategy arena. Maybe they never quite reach the heights of their obvious inspirations, but they punch high enough and hard enough and weird enough above their weight class to make any RPG buff or strategy senpai take notice. Sure, they can be frustratingly linear and buggy at their worst, but at their best, the player has unparalleled freedom to approach the game's many missions. Those that would dismiss these games as just more budget bargain bin Eurojank would be missing out on something pretty unique. They may not be the prettiest or most polished strategy RPGs under the sun, but gosh darn it, they got heart. They got heart, I say. And most importantly, they remind us that World War II games used to be fresh and good. If you've saved the world from aliens several times over in XCOM or repeatedly defeated Daedriana in Jagged Alliance 2, you'd do well to put Silent Storm into your mess kit. And eat it. Actually eat this one. And you know what? We'd love it if you'd put us into your mess kit too. You can pack us in all snugly like next to your K-rations and Zippo lighter by hitting that subscribe button and touching the little bell thingy down there. And we'll be sure to let you know when our next campaign into the history of gaming makes a landing. Ah, we're coming in hot! If you've the courage to join the brave and the bold in sharing this video, why we'd very much appreciate it, soldier. Thank you for watching. Tell a buddy, put us on a sandwich, and we'll see you on the next Two-Headed Hero.
Hot motherfucking trucking in the desert afternoon. Got a little truck and we're gonna get there soon. <laughs>